I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. Well, good morning. I'm so glad to see you here this morning. Over the past three weeks, we have been walking through the names, titles, and descriptions of God. And we know that our God is a triune God, meaning He is three persons. Week one, we talked about the names, titles, and descriptions of God the Father. Week two, we talked about the names, titles, and descriptions of God the Son. Week three, we talked about the names, titles, and descriptions of God the Holy Spirit. The names, titles, and descriptions of our great God come from the Bible, God's holy word. Then two Sundays ago, we talked about the power of God's word. Last Sunday, we talked about faith. We talked about how Peter walked on the water by faith, but then his faith turned into doubt and his life started sinking. Today, we're going to focus on praise. Praising the Lord daily is absolutely necessary to living a powerful, peaceful, uplifted, fruitful, and joyful Christian life daily. That said, on our next slide, you'll see today's sermon title and passage, The Power of Praise. The Power of Praise will be in Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 16, and Psalm 113, and possibly Psalm 145. On our next several slides, you will see our main biblical passage for today. So if you will, take your Bibles and let's read Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 16. And we'll talk about them as we move through them. And I'll be reading to you out of the NASB version. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Now, how do people react when they're hot and thirsty and tired, when they don't have water and they don't have food? Don't people get grumpy? Don't people get cranky? Don't people get frustrated? Well, look at verse 2. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? A little more, and they will stone me. These people are frustrated. Now they've gotten their leader, Moses, frustrated. So everybody's frustrated. The people and the spiritual leaders, they're all frustrated. So look at verse 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Verse 8, Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So let's stop here. What we have seen is that this people is tired, they're grumbling, they're complaining, they're cranky, they're having to walk around in the wilderness because they're not really trusting God. They're now grumbling about the leadership and saying Moses could be doing a better job and please give us water and what, you bring us out here to kill us? I mean, they're just really naysayers. Their, their attitude is poor. They've kind of made gro uh, Moses grumble and call out to the Lord and cry out to the Lord for help. And now all of a sudden they've got a war they've got to fight. So just as soon as God met their needs for water, now all of a sudden they've got a war on their hands. So this is a tough time. This is a tough season that this congregation's going through. Verse 9. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed, and when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. 
Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sunset. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. When the Lord said to Mo- then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, The Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Listen, it's not about what strength your army has. Joshua had a good fighting people and they went out to fight. But when they were fighting, whenever their arms were, whenever Moses' hands were raised, giving glory to God, praising God for who he was, then Joshua's army was the stronger army and they were pushing back the enemy. Whenever we quit praising God and whenever our arms come down, Then the opposing spiritual warfare gets heavier, and so that army was encroaching on them. But then Moses saw the difference. When we praise God, then we are able to win, and we see victory. When we quit praising God, then the enemy is stronger. The enemy starts coming in, and we don't see victory. We see defeat. So if we praise God, we see more victory. When we quit praising God and looking down, we don't see victory. When we praise God, we see victory. When we quit praising God, we see defeat. Are you getting the pattern? Now, even though you don't see this in this particular way carried out when David goes to fight his wars or King Saul fighting his wars or other kings, the whole point was whenever they were walking in the Lord, whenever they were obedient, whenever they did what God said, when they were praising his name, they were always victorious. When the people were disobedient and not praising God, then they were not victorious. Well, on our next slide, you'll see the biblical definition of the word Praise. The Hebrew word for praise is pronounced hale. Hale. Interestingly enough, it sounds just like our word hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's praise. That's what hallelujah means. We're praising God. So hale in Hebrew, like hallelujah. And it means to shine, to make a show, to boast, to rave. To celebrate, to commend, to glory, to give light, to sing, to be worthy of praise, to shine. Whenever we're praising God, that's what we're doing. We're shining for Him, and then we turn the spotlight on Him. We are making a show. We're making much of God. We're boasting in the mighty and powerful name of God and the love of God and the mercy of God. And we're raving. We're raving about him. We're not complaining about him. Remember, these people were complaining about, oh, did you bring us out here to die? We should have stayed in Egypt. Well, what did God turn around? He showed Moses, you start praising me. Quit complaining about me. Praise me and I'll bring you victory. So we need to rave about our God. Oh, we know how to rave about the cowboys. Or we know how to rave about the baseball team, the Rangers. We know how to rave about this and rave about that. And we rave about a new promotion, rave about having a higher paycheck. We rave about all kinds of things. When's the last time you raved about God? That's what our lost generation needs to say. To celebrate. Praise means that you're going to celebrate God. Is that what you're doing when you worship on Sundays? Are you celebrating the goodness of the King, Jesus Christ? Amen. Guys, this is a sermon on praise. We're going to be praising God today. We're not praising Satan and the darkness of this world. We're praising Jesus, who in 1 Peter chapter 2 says he's the marvelous light. And to give glory. When we praise, you're giving glory to God. So don't you think we need to praise God all day long? Sometimes we don't think about God hardly at all unless we need a parking space close to Target. That's not glorifying God. Do you talk about God at work? Do you talk about God in the car even when nobody's there? Do you bless the people driving near you, not give them the finger? But are you praising God for them and saying, Lord, bless them in their day. Help them. We never know what problems are going in their lives. Help those people. Do you commend God? Do you give out his light? Do you sing to him? How often do you have praise music in your quiet time? 
I have praise music every time I open my Bible. Sometimes I'm actually singing praise music in my headphones while I'm studying the Bible and then writing notes. I'm multitasking with all kinds of spiritual discipline so that I can really sing to Jesus and shine his light. And then the next one says to be worthy of praise. Is he worthy of praise? Jesus is worthy of praise. All the praise you can give him. Listen, being in heaven one day when we're not here anymore and our old sin nature is gone and all you have is a new nature and all you are surrounded by is millions and billions of other believers in the angelic host of heaven, all we can do is praise him for eternity. I, don't, I can't even picture that. Will we stop to eat? I don't understand what it's going to be like in there, but I'm telling you, to come before the throne of that kind of majesty and splendor, we're just going to be praising, 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 praising. I used to remember being in seminary, boy, and the seminary professors, man, a lot of them just are so deep in their scholarly studies and their walk. And I remember one professor saying, even the angels are afraid before the throne of God just to even say, holy, holy, holy. So a lot of times they don't even just say it out loud, but there's this rumbling that's going on with, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's what angelic beings cry out every day, every day. When's the last time you got up and said, holy, holy, holy. Or did you go, oh, we're slept this morning. i got to hurry up and get in the shower, you know, and whatever. The kids aren't dressed. I, mean, I need to get my, oh, I don't even have time for a Pop-Tart. I really got to get in the car. You know, like, boom, 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 we're tow, tow away in 121. I get out. Next thing you know, the computer's down. you got to call IT. you got to get to working with those people. Next thing you know, you got voicemails that's going to take you to 1 o'clock to answer and return. Emails out the wazoo and blah, 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 blah. Your co-worker is just being a pain in the rear and on and on. Let me tell you what you do. You start your day by waking up and going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Lord, I'm going to worship you all day. Whenever my mind's not tied up with something else, I'm going to utter a prayer. I'm going to utter a praise. I'm going to sink a scripture in. I'm going to read the word of God, and then I'm going to go back and answer another email. Then I might listen to some praise music in my headphones in my cubicle. But I'm going to praise your holy name. And I'm going to shine. I'm going to shine for you. Did you know that without even saying a word, you can shine. When people come to church and they see you. What kind of Jesus do you know? What kind of Jesus is in your soul? If people come to church and that's what they see, I'd want another God. Personally, if it was me, I would want another God. What kind of God do people see and just your body language. Is your body language screaming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Is that what he's doing in your life to where people can see it? I want to read to you Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. A servant of God never, ever, ever stops praising the name of the Lord. Verse 3, from the rising of the sun to its setting. What does that mean? From the time you get up to the time you go to bed. From the time the sun comes up to the time the sun sets. You are to praise the Lord. You are to bless the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Think about this. How high are the heavens? We got three heavens Paul tells us about in Corinthians. You got the first heavens, which is kind of like where our birds fly and where our planes fly around 36,000 feet. The secondary heavens is kind of like past our atmosphere where you lose gravity, but you kind of got our orbiting satellites and areas like that. And then you've got the planets. The third heavens is that spiritual heaven where God is on his throne with the angelic host. But look at what verse 4 says. The Lord is high above all nations and the glo his glory is above the heavens. God's glory is even higher than the third heaven. That's 
pretty high. His glory is above the heavens. And the Lord is high above all nations. There's a lot of nations on earth. Our God is above all nations. Every leader must bow before our great God. Verse 5, who is like the Lord our God? Who is enthroned on high? Who is like him? Who do you know? What Hollywood star, what rock star, what international person, who do you know that is like our God? Nobody. Verse 6, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Listen, God's glory is above the heavens and he resides in the heavens. But even down on this earth, God sees the poor. He sees the needy. And what does it say? Does he just look at him and go, hmm, so sad. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. Verse 8, to make them sit with princes and with the princes of his people. To make the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Did you know there's not a woman alive that can give birth to a baby if God doesn't make her pregnant? He is the one that forms babies in the womb. God is the creator of every human life. He created every atheist. Whether they know him or not. There is not one person that's ever been born, and there's over 7 billion people alive right now, today, as I speak. Not even counting all the people back to Adam and Eve's day, and Noah's day, and Abraham's day, and King David's day, or the people yet to come, if Jesus tarries. Just today, there are 7 billion people. Not a one of them, not a one of them was created in some other way besides the Creator's hand. I've never created a person, much less seven billion people. I'm saying that's a great God. So verse 9, he makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. Now I want to go over to Psalm 145. This is a Psalm of David. I will extol you, my God, O King. What does extol mean? I will exalt you. I will boast in you. I will extol told you my God O King and I will bless your name forever and ever sounds a lot like Psalm 113 doesn't it every day I will bless you well you know what if you're going to tell God I'm going to bless you every day you best not skip one I'm going to bless you every day now let me ask you church there's seven days coming up this week unless Jesus takes your life or he returns for the second coming which day this week are you choosing to not praise him I'll give you an assignment. It's what King David told the Lord. He wrote it down. He goes, every day I will bless you. What if you had a series of days where you bless God and you praise God and then the next week and then the next week and the next week? What do you think would happen to your Christian life? Can you see the difference? Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. You'll never be able to find out how truly great God is. You can't search it out. You can't go on Google. You can't go on internet. You can't hear the pastor of even the best preacher on this planet and still be able to discern how great he is. His greatness is beyond knowing. Even in heaven... How could you really ascertain the greatness of God if his glory is above the heavens? You can't. Verse 4, one generation shall praise your words to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Did you know that that's what the ancients of old did in the Old Testament? The people that were in the latter part of the Old Testament, they would talk about Adam and Eve and Abraham and Moses and they would talk about them and then the people in the New Testament would talk about the people in the Old Testament and they would talk about what God did as far as his wonders and mighty works in their lives. What do we do in the New Testament church? We talk about what God did in the Old Testament. We talk about what God did in the New Testament. Do we not constantly do what is in this verse? One generation shall praise your works to another. Oh, that we would not lose a generation of sharing what God has done to the future generations. Our children need to hear us talking about the wonderful works of the Lord from long ago. 
Are you telling your children and grandchildren about what God has done? Tell them what God has done. Verse 5, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. I'm going to think. I'm going to ponder about your glorious splendor. I'm going to ponder. I'm going to think about your majesty. I'm going to think about your wonderful works. I will meditate. You've heard me use the word marinate. Like if you're going to marinate your steaks. You don't just pour marinade seasoning on steaks and go flop them on the grill. It just burns right off. How do you truly marinate a steak? You put it in some type of container like a bowl, and then you mix up your concoction, and then you actually pour it all over. There may have Worcestershire sauce or soy sauce and different seasonings, and you pour it all over the meat, and then you put it in the refrigerator overnight. You leave it all night. You leave it all the next day, because what's the the meat going to do? Soak it up. Soak it up. Meditation is like marinating. You actually marinate on the Word of God till it is soaked into your soul. Not like you just read a verse and ran off to the office and said, I have my quiet time. That's just like putting your seasonings on your steak and you throw it on the grill, it rolled right off. That verse didn't change your life a bit. But if you were to think about that verse before you went to bed, you were to wake up thinking about it. You thought about it all day. You thought about that after. You thought about it that night. That verse becomes part of who you are. That verse is marinating into your soul. Verse 6, men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts. Are we as Christians going and talking about the awesome power of God if you talk about how awesome and powerful the cowboys are that's okay for a little conversation I guess but move on to something truly powerful and truly awesome which is the acts of God verse 7 they shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness do you have a memory of what God has done do you store up into your memory? And a lot of us as we get older and say, well, we can't remember as much as we used to. I think some of that is we don't actually try to put more in the memory banks. We need to start working our memories out and start putting more of God's holy word in there. And then we would have more from memory to share. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully at your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. How are we with anger? Aren't we quick to anger? Well, we can get angry at the drop of a hat. Our God is patient. He is slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. The Lord is good to all. Did you know there's not one person breathing that God is not good to? Now, there's more abundant blessings he bestows if they're his child, if they're born again, if they're Christians. But the Lord is good to all people, even mass murderers, even rapists. Even killers, even bank robbers. The Lord is good to all. I guarantee if you sat down with some mass murderer, you could, they could still tell you about maybe they had a good mom, maybe they didn't have a good dad, or at least they had food on their table. They could, there's still things that they could say, this was good in my life. God is the one that is responsible for receiving the praise for the good that was even in their lives. Verse 10, all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Now, verses 11, 12, and 13 have to do with God's kingdom and his dominion over his kingdom. So they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of your majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. When is God finally not going to be in control? Is there ever coming a time for our holy God that sits in the heavens, whose glory is above the heavens, at when, at what time does his dominion end? Never. God's dominion is throughout all generations. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. Boy, that's a beautiful verse. I just had to stop there in my study this week. Have you ever fallen? Whether fallen into sin fallen into despair, fallen into hopelessness, 
fallen into whatever? Well, did you know God didn't leave you there? He will never leave you there. The Lord sustains all who fall. So when people say, I'm in perpetual depression, I'm in perpetual anxiety, well, God doesn't intend to leave you there. He's sustaining you. Why are you still there? If God is the one who sustains, why are you still in that condition? Do you think God wants people to be joyful and praising? Or anxiety-filled and depressed and can't do nothing but barely get out of bed, if that. Which do you think God prefers? He wants us to get up and to praise Him and to go about and share His mighty works and deeds with everyone we come in contact with. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. If you are bowed down, that's the best place you can be in life. Bow down and let God lift you up. Bow down and let God lift you up. Bow down and let God lift you up. Verse 15, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due time. Did you know all of the beasts of the field, all the birds of the air, all the fish of the sea, all of mankind, we look to God for food. Did you know if God brings famine, you don't eat? Neither do the animals. God provides food. Outside of God, there's no food. And no water, as we saw in Exodus 17. God is the one that provides water and food. Amen? If he doesn't provide it, you don't get it. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his ways deeds I was around a man one time and I won't even use the word because I'm standing in the pulpit the Lord is righteous in all his ways well this guy sat in my pastoral care office at another church and said the Lord really blanked up in my life you can imagine a word I just wanted to move because lightning is going to strike never say that the Lord has messed up in any way he cannot do anything that is not good and righteous the Lord is righteous in all his ways. God can never sin. God can never do a poor job of providing for his children and the beasts. He can't do a poor job. Verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. What happens if you don't call? He's not near. You have to call and then you can tell that he's near because he will answer. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. One day, all of the wicked people and all of the wicked deeds that you see about will be cast into hell. There will be no more evil. There will be no more wickedness. But God is going to take all of those that loves him and he will keep them with him forever. Verse 21. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. All flesh. Even the beasts of the field. Everything's going to give praise to God. Do you remember that part uh, back when Jesus was on the earth? And he said, if people won't give him praise, even the stones will cry out. A stone is an inanimate object. It's not alive, does not have a soul. But if men refuse to give God praise, inanimate, unliving objects will come to life and praise God. Is that not cool? I want to be the one that praises God. What about you? Well, we're going to move into a time of offering. Our men are going to come up. We're going to have the Lord's table. We're going to offer praise to him as we gather at the Lord's table for the Lord's Supper. As these men come and they start to prepare the elements, if you're going to praise God to the deepest depths, you know what you have to do? Confess sin. You have to confess it, but don't stop there. You have to repent of your sin. What did we say repentance is in a few sermons ago? Repentance is the turning away 180 degrees, the other edition. Remorse is being sad that you got caught in your sin. Repentance is truly saying, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was evil. It was sinful. It was wicked. 
I confess it, and I repent of it, and I'm going to turn. So these men are going to be handing out the elements, but while they're doing that, you spend time in your heart with your head bowed, and you go to God and say, God, I want to give you full praise today. I know I can't praise you fully because there's things in my life that are not right with you. And I want to make them right with you. So before I partake of Jesus' body symbolically or Jesus' blood symbolically, I want to get this right. Whatever it is that's between you and God, confess it, repent of it, he'll remove it, and then you can praise him anew and you'll be able to praise him in the midst of enjoying food and drink at the Lord's table. Amen? Spend time in prayer. After you have confessed and repented and God has removed that sin from you, have some time with God telling him like David did, what is it you're going to do this week? He wants to know about how you're going to live. You've already made plans for what you're going to do at your office, I'm sure. I'm sure you've set appointments. I'm sure you've got emails you know that you're going to reply to because on Friday you said, I'll return this email on Monday. You've already made plans about your week. Why don't you tell God what you plan? I plan to wake up in the morning, Lord, on Monday morning. I'm going to wake up earlier than usual. I'm going to hit the snooze. I'm going to set the timer, and I'm going to get up earlier, and I'm going to engage in the spiritual quiet time. And so I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to have praise music. I'm going to study the Word of God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to confess sin. I'm going to spend time with you. And, Lord, I'm going to do this on Tuesday morning. And, Lord, I know that there are people in my office that I need to share the gospel with. And I'm going to share the gospel with at least one person this week. And I want you to point out, Lord, who it is. Whatever it is you want to tell the Lord, make a plan. We all have day timers now. We have calendars on our phones. And we set appointments. And we've set all kinds of things for this week. If I was to take your phone or your day timer, I could open it up. And I could see all of the things that you have scheduled for this week. And as the week goes along, you'll add to it. Have you added the Lord in to your day timer? Have you added him into your calendar? Does he know when to expect you? Do you have an appointment? with him well, we're going to read through the passage where Jesus actually sat down with the very first disciples and he ate the Lord's Supper with them he instituted and he told them a little bit about it and we're going to read his words today before we take the elements I'm in Luke chapter 22 starting in verse 14 going through verse 20 when the hour had come he reclined at the table and the apostles with him and he said to them I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Did you hear the word earnestly? He'd been thinking about it. He'd been planning it. So he was moving them from Passover into the Lord's Supper. Some churches call it communion, but really the more biblical term is Lord's Supper. It was a table. It was a meal, not just communion. And so he says, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. How many times in your Christian life have you drawn around God's table and partaken of the elements? Jesus never took it again after this moment. But he will enjoy it again with us one day at the marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven. But he's still waiting. It's our opportunity to sit at the table. Verse 17, and when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said... 
take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. By taking the Lord's Supper, do you realize that's a praise? We are praising him through the act of coming to church and worshiping at the Lord's table. We're praising him. Verse 20, and in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I can't help but think about it every time that we take this grape juice which symbolizes Jesus' blood can you imagine just the drops of blood that fell from his body that ran from his hands that dripped onto the ground that ran from his side where the spear had been that went down from his feet down the cross and just hit the dusty ground holy blood holy blood that blood just hit the ground but just whenever I partake of the Lord's Supper it reminds me of his blood This is what I'd like for you to take away from today. We've talked about praise from the Old Testament, Nexus 17. We've talked about it from Psalms 113, Psalm 145. We've talked about how do we praise God, and that's by taking the Lord's Supper with a cleansed heart, with a cleansed mind, with a cleansed soul. Look at this slide. A praising life yields a powerful life. I don't believe I could ever walk up to a Christian and say, do you want to live a powerful life in Jesus Christ? I guarantee you the answer would always be yes. I don't think I could walk up to a Christian and go, do you want to live a powerful life in Jesus Christ? And go, oh, no, not really. I'm okay with a so-so life. I, I don't really want to be powerful in my Christian walk. I don't, I don't think any Christian would ever tell me that. So all Christians desire to live a powerful life in Jesus Christ. But how many Christians do you know that really live a powerful life? Maybe you're one of them. But did you think that God wanted every Christian to live a powerful life? Do you think God wants any anemic Christians? No. God's desire is that every child live a powerful life. Earthly parents, even if they have 15 children, they don't say, well, I hope these 12 grow up to be healthy and strong and powerful, and I hope those are weak and anemic and can barely do anything. What parent would say that? God wants all of his children to live powerful Christian lives. So here's where I think the struggle is. God is almighty. He has all power. But we are weak and we suffer and we have problems. And sometimes we have problems. You ever heard somebody say, well, under the circumstances, I want to look at them and go, what are you doing under there? Get out from under the circumstances and praise God. That's what Moses saw when his hands were up, they would win their battles. When he dropped his hands, they were losing the battle. When they raised their hands, they were winning the battle. Here's what I think happens in our current day. When you're going through battles and struggles and difficulties and tragedies, you've lowered your hands. You're wringing your hands. You're just, oh, me, and you're just fretting, and you're thinking about whatever. You're losing the battle because you're not praising. What do you do when things are going wrong? Praise God. I'm going to think of everything I can do to praise him. What do you do when you're depressed? Well, I'm too depressed to praise God. No, you're not. Even a depressed person can hit a button on the radio and make it play. Even a depressed person can sing. Just start praising God. And even if you have to sit there and say, okay, I'm in my quiet time, Lord. I'm just depressed as I can be. You just let the singing of the song and the spiritual leader singing that song, just let them sing and you watch what starts to happen. The Holy Spirit's taking your feeble effort to praise Him, and He will help you praise Him. And before long, you're not nearly as down about your problem or your struggle because you're praising God. I want you to learn to praise God. When you don't have your hands lifted in prayer, and when you're down here and you're not giving God the praise and glory due His name, He's not going to lift you up. Your battles will defeat you. They even said, well, Lord... We can see that when Moses' hands are up, praising you, giving you the honor for the, the victory of the battle, they put a stone under him and said, sit down. One man got over here and held him up because he, he just couldn't. And the other man got over here and held him up because he was tired. Did you know brother ought to help brother praise God? I need to help Cynthia praise God when their arms get tired. I need to help Billy 
Praise God when our arms get tired. I need to help Anthony. Praise God when his arms get tired. When my arms get tired, Jerry needs to come and hold up one arm and say, keep praising God, brother. Hal needs to come get the other arm, right? And we just keep holding each other's brother's and sister's arm. After a while, you get tired. Even in the Old Testament, we see the value of the congregation. The three men, Moses, Aaron, and Hur, they worked together to win the battle. Did you realize, even though they were down there fighting, those guys didn't win the battle. God did through praise. What are you going through right now that you think, I'm not going to make it, this isn't going to turn out okay, I'm going to lose this battle. Have you praised God over it? And you know what Moses said? The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. I praise the Lord. The Lord is our banner. That enemy is not stronger than my God. My God is stronger than the enemy. And holding his hands up, he gave praise. What are you going through in your life right now? Maybe you've got five problems. You know what you need to do? Praise five times harder. Five times more often. And I can't be wrong because it's in the scripture. If you want to win your battles, and I don't care if it's sexual, financial, marital, family, job, material, whatever it is. If you want to win your battles biblically through Jesus Christ, you have to praise. You have to say, God, I can't, but you can. God, this won't overtake me because you won't let it. God, I need to get out from under here and I need to praise you. I'm so down with this. I'm so burdened with this. I'm, I can't give you. I'm going to give you the glory as if you've already brought me from it. The powerful life doesn't just happen. If you keep waiting for God to make you the strong, powerful Christian and you're scratching your head wondering why it hasn't happened in 30 years, you're not praising. You've got to praise your God. You've got to praise your God. Even before you win the battle, did you realize they praised him before they won the battle? They won the battle because they did the praising first. It wasn't like, we think praising goes on after you win the game. You praise to win the game spiritually. You praise to win the game before you win the game. A praising life yields a powerful life. Let's stand and worship Jesus Christ our Lord.